Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Bible in One Year with the Preacher's Husband. Today we are going through 1 Chronicles chapter 26 through 29 and we're also going to do Psalm 127. Okay. Ooh, it's been a long day, sorry about that. Tomorrow we're going to do Psalm 111 through 118, so all of those in between as well. So we're going to jump right in. I'm going to throw a picture up here of Solomon's temple just to give us a foreshadowing of what's to come as we go through this. Um, chapter 26 starts out with the Levitical gatekeepers. Um, this list of gatekeepers is limited to two Levitical clans of Kohath and Merari, as we've heard before. But since Asaph, the mu musician, belonged to the clan of Gershom, the Asaph that's mentioned here is actually a different person. It's possibly the Asaph here should have read Abiasaph instead, as it does in the LXX. And that also happened in chapter 9, verse 18, just so we know. Not get those two guys confused. We get into verse 12, and the chronicler here emphasizes that the service these gatekeepers performed was just as significant as the duties of those who led in the worship service. And he goes on to explain that. We get over to the Levitical treasurers and other officials. Now, the gatekeepers themselves, they came primarily from the clan of Merari and Kohath, like we said, but the Gershonites were assigned to watch over the treasuries of the temple. This included guarding temple resources from theft or vandalism, as well as accounting for them and keeping them stored. Um, Ahija supervised this work. The treasures included long-term deposits as well as funds needed for day-to-day -day operations of the temple. Now, one other group of Levites needed to be organized here as well, and these were the officers and judges who would enforce the divine law in Israel. Now, th this process here that David's going through is just basically setting up all of the structures for leadership that is going to afford Solomon to be successful in his adventures as he does. So we get to chapter 27 and there are David's secular officials, the ones that are not holy, not um, godly officials, but just secular officials to do those secular jobs. Um, and of course that would include the army as well. The most important category of classification here is that there were 12 divisions of the armies, and they were composed of 24,000 soldiers each. Each of those units was on duty for one month out of the year during the time of peace. Now, during Solomon's time, there was a lot of peace. During the times of war, though, obviously, everyone would be mobilized. And many of the names that appear here also appeared in that list of the 30 in chapter 11, if you remember. So that stuck out to me. Verse 16 um, this verse begins a list of those who were in charge of each tribe. Um, Gad and Asher were left out, perhaps because maybe they were governed by the leaders of another tribe or something. But the number of men on the list still comes to 12 because each of the two halves of Manasseh is represented separately, and the Levites have two representatives as well. So that brings them from 10 to 12 by doing that. And then verses 25 through 33, um, this tells about David's cabinet. Basically, like the president has a cabinet, this would be the king having a cabinet, just like our president does in the United States. Next, chapter 28, we've got David commissions Solomon to build the temple. This is where the meat and potatoes comes in. He's basically um, telling Solomon, God wouldn't let me build this temple. It's your job to do it. So, the chronicler here, the questions of who would be the next king and who would build the temple are synonymous because David called another meeting of all the leaders of Israel here in which he reiterated his answer to both of these questions. Solomon's going to be building a temple. Solomon's going to be your king. And this is the very last speech that David gives in his life. Now, we get to verse 9 and David directs Solomon's commitment not just to the law but to the lord the covenant that god made with david about the continuation of his house on the throne does not overrule solomon's obligation to walk with the lord just because 
God said, I promise you I'm going to keep your family on the throne. That does come with some stipulations. The stipulations are they got to walk with God along the way. They can't just go off on their own little thing, do their own little thing, and not, not believe in God, not, not look to God. So they had to obey God no matter what. And Solomon was no different. So David made a public display of handing Solomon all of this information that had gone on in the last six chapters, all of these sections and all of these commissions and leaders and all those groups that he put together. He handed that information to him in public. So there was it was recorded publicly that he was going to be the next king. And then we get to chapter 29, contributions for building the temple. There were tons of them. They were lists and piles of stuff. We get to verse 10, though, and we get to the beginning of David's prayer. And this is a very lengthy prayer, but he begins it in a very important way, and that is by focusing on God. Pretty much what he's trying to tell Solomon as well. Focus on God. Focus on the temple. And as David continued to focus on God, he acknowledged here some very important truths. It's not possible to give anything to God because God owns everything. See, you can't give anything to God. And that's kind of why Jesus' gift to us is free. We don't have to do anything to get eternal life. Jesus already paid the price for it. And God owns everything. So what can we give to God? Hmm. Something to think about. David also declared that it's not possible to deceive God because he knows everything. He knows exactly um, who is giving willingly out of true devotion to him and who is giving just to be seen by others. He knows this. So if you're going to your church and you're putting money in an offering plate, if you're doing it just so you can be seen by other people doing it, then you're not giving for the right reasons. If you're not giving from your heart, truly because you love God and you want to, you're want you devoted to God, um, that's going to be the problem that's going to be between you and God. God sees that as well. The key here to a great relationship with God is a heart that wants to please God. So that is hugely important. In verses 20 to 22, after sacrifices and a feast right here, David made Solomon the king for a second time. Now, a lot of commentators are divided on the reference to a first coronation and how to interpret chapter 23, verse 1, which states that David installed Solomon as king. Some interpreters see this verse as a general summary of the events that are, that are amplified in this chapter, but this mention of a second coronation could also be an understated reference to the turmoil that we read about later in 1 Kings chapter 1. Now this turmoil resulted in David declaring Solomon to be king as an emergency measure in opposition to Adonijah's bid for the throne, if y'all remember that. In either case, the transfer of power from David to Solomon proceeded smoothly and he was acclaimed by all of Israel. And then, of course, in verse 26 through 30, we get a summary of David's life that proclaims him as a good, a good king who reigned to a good old age. So, now we're going to move on to Psalm 127. And this in the CSB is titled, The Blessing of the Lord. Now, in the King James Version, it is titled, Laboring and Prospering with the Lord. To me, the very first verse stuck out the most of this entire thing. It says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Now that stuck out to me quite handily, and it must have stuck out to Dwight D. Eisenhower as well, because right here, you see Dwight D. Eisenhower in a photograph from 1953 when this was his inauguration. This was when he was being sworn in as President of the United States. And as he was doing that, where his hand is laying is on Psalm 127, verse 1, as he became President of the United States. So, we had something in common. Those verses stuck out to both of us. How neat is that? Well, I hope this has touched you. If it has, 
click the like button and the subscribe button and of course click the little jingle bell so you can get notified the next time I upload a video which will be tomorrow as we go through Psalm 111 through Psalm 118 for another episode of the Bible in one year with the preacher's husband. We'll see you then.